Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in Arlington, Moco, Loudoun, Prince William, as well as those of you online. It's good to be together around God's Word. And regardless of where you are, I want to welcome you officially to the start of our 2022 Metro DC Spring Break Mission Trip. Now, you might think, I didn't sign up for a mission trip, but I have surprising news for you. When you walked into the room where you are sitting right now or at other locations or joined in online, if you are a follower of Jesus, then you signed up. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you're here or joining in online with a family member or a friend who's invited you, or maybe you're exploring Christianity on your own, we are really glad you're here. And we would love for you to be a part of this mission trip with us. I'll talk more about that later. But for everyone who is a follower of Jesus, this is actually what it means to be a follower of Jesus. When you chose to follow Jesus, you signed up, not just for a mission trip, but for a mission life. Amen. So there's a sense in which this Sunday is no different than any other Sunday. This is a gathering of Jesus people on mission in the world. But the reason I'm welcoming you to a two-week mission trip today is because of the word we're about to hear from God. So we're walking through the story of Jesus in the book of Mark, and today we come to a time when Jesus sent his disciples out on a short-term mission trip. So let's go ahead and read it together, and then I'll explain more. Mark chapter 6, verse 7. And Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now, we don't know exactly how long this mission trip lasted, but we do know it was for a brief period of time, and if you read down to what happens right after this in Mark, you see the story of how John the Baptist died, which goes from verse 14, where we just left off, all the way down to verse 29, and then you pick up in verse 30, listen to what it says. It says, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So at this point, they've come back, and they spend time debriefing with Jesus all that had happened on this trip. The reason, then, I'm calling this a two-week mission trip for us is because next Sunday, Lord willing, our plan is to study verses 14 through 29 together about John the Baptist, and then we'll come back to verse 30 two Sundays from now. So we're going to look at the next two weeks as a mission trip that starts with Jesus sending out his disciples today and then ends when we come back together two Sundays from now in verse 30. So basically, over these next two weeks, I want to call us to do what Jesus called his disciples to do in this text today, to go on a mission trip. Now, if you've never been on a mission trip before, here's how it works. You travel with a group of people to a particular place. I think about large trips we've taken as a church to a place like DR or, the, or Ethiopia, and the whole goal of the trip is to work together in that place to build up the church and to lead people to Jesus. That's what you're on the trip for. And then usually, when you get to that place, everybody gets together to make sure you all understand, all right, here we are, and here's what we're going to be doing. So that's what we're doing today. Here we are in our nation's capital. 
which interestingly, a lot of people come to Metro DC for mission trips. It just so happens we live here. So let's think about where we are, a metropolitan area of over 6 million people. And research shows that in this location, where we're going on our mission trip over the next two weeks, about 12.5% of people are in churches. Now, we don't know what kinds of churches, and we do know that just because someone is in church does not mean that they're a follower of Jesus. All kinds of people call themselves Christians and go to church who are not followers of Jesus. But even if we assume that all of the people who are in churches are Jesus people, that still leaves over 5.3 million people in this city where we're doing this mission trip who don't know Jesus. 5.3 million people who, if they were to die right now, would go to everlasting, never-ending judgment and suffering. Like never-ending. Now, usually on a mission trip, you don't know any of these people you're going to be interacting with, but that's different for us during the next couple of weeks because some of these people are your family or your friends or your neighbors. Some are your classmates at school or teammates in sports or people you work out with at the gym. Some are your coworkers. So some of them you interact with all the time. And then there are others you'll interact with for the first time over the next two weeks in a store or a restaurant or wherever else you might go. I think of an Uber driver I met on a ride last week from Soviet Georgia. And as we talked about the war in Ukraine, I asked him, if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you would spend eternity? He looked back at me in the rear view mirror and said, huh, that is a really good question, man. He said, I have no idea. But if I were to guess, I don't think I'd go to heaven. So I shared the gospel with him and invited him to put his trust in Jesus and gave him my contact information to follow up. And there are over 5 million individual people, men, women, boys, girls, like that Uber driver, right now in this city who don't know Jesus. So we have a lot of work to do together. And that's key. None of us is in this alone. You don't go on a mission trip alone. Jesus gave these instructions in Mark 6 collectively to his disciples and even called them to go out together two by two. This is what we're calling every member of MBC to be a part of, a church group or a community that's caring for each other like family and growing together in Christ and making disciples together on mission. You can always find out information about how to connect with one of those groups on our website. This is what it means to be the church. It means to be on mission together. Sadly, we've created a whole picture of church today as an event that you attend on a Sunday every once in a while or even just join in online. When that's not church, it's what we've created and called church, but it's not what Jesus calls church. Church is Jesus' people united together on a mission. So let's think about this mission trip that he's sending us out on. And I really want us to think specifically about the next two weeks. Like let's picture it. Like we've traveled to Metro DC for the next two weeks, and today we're kicking off our trip. And I want to just give us five simple words of encouragement for us on this trip, straight from this text. You might write them down. First, I want to encourage us to go in Jesus' name. Over the next two weeks, this week and next, let's go out from wherever we're sitting right now in Jesus' name. Verse 7, Jesus called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. There's so much here in just this one verse, but let's think about it together. Like Jesus, think about who he's sending out here, the 12. 
And we obviously, a couple thousand years later, have a lot of respect for these disciples and all they did. But by this point in the book of Mark, let's just think about the impression we have of them. Because the more we think about what we've seen of these guys, the more we'll think these guys were not the sharpest tools in the shed. And this is not the all-star team you want on a mission trip. Just two chapters before this, Jesus told a, a relatively simple parable of the soils. They were clueless. Right after that in chapter 4, they were afraid and scared. In chapter 5, they're all frustrated. And keep in mind, none of these guys was from the religious elite or anything elite. They were common at best, despised at worst. Fishermen, a tax collector, a zealot who would be seen like a terrorist. And they all still had a lot to learn. It's not like they'd arrived. Two chapters after this, Jesus says to them, do you guys still not get it? Two chapters after that, they're arguing with each other over who's better than the other. But here they are in Mark chapter 6, and Jesus is sending them out to cast out demons and unclean spirits and to heal people and to preach. How is that possible? And the answer is in these words. He sent them out. That's actually one word in the original language of the New Testament, apostello, from which we get the word apostle. It literally means to send out on an authorized mission on someone else's behalf. And that is the picture of what's happening here. Jesus is authorizing this group of disciples to go out in his name with his authority to do his work in his power. And that's so important to realize. These guys weren't going out to start their own work. They were extending Jesus' work. They were not going out on their own. They were going out in Jesus' name as Jesus' representatives with Jesus' message and Jesus' power and Jesus' authority to do Jesus' work. They couldn't cast out unclean spirits on their own, heal people on their own, preach on their own. Not these guys. Not in and of themselves. The whole point is that they would be going out in Jesus' name. And the same is true for all of us on this mission trip over the next two weeks. So I look around this room, and with all due respect, you are not the sharpest tools in the shed. And I'm looking through the cameras at those of you at other locations and online, and you're not either. And here's what I mean. I see people all across this room and other locations, those of you online, I see people who are struggling in your faith in a variety of different ways. I see some people for whom it was a struggle to even show up today. I see people who have so much more to learn about the Bible and what it means to follow Jesus. I see people who feel tired and weak in a variety of ways. I see a host of people with struggles with sin and doubts and fears and worries and anxiety. And I see people who are afraid to share the gospel to the point where most, let's be honest, don't do it. We've asked that question in surveys across our church family, and the majority of us hardly ever, if ever, share the gospel. You feel uncomfortable when you have the opportunity, you're not quite sure how to begin a conversation that leads to talking about Jesus. And even if you do, you get in situations where you can start that conversation, but you bail. And at this point, I should just add, I am one of those people. And you might say, no, you're not, you're the pastor. And to that, I would say, you are a fool. I'm really not trying to offend you, but you're a fool to think that any pastor doesn't have more to learn or doesn't have struggles and fears and weakness. 
and doesn't sometimes sit silent in the face of every oppor- everyday opportunities to share the gospel. So brothers and sisters, we're all in this together. But Jesus, follow this, Jesus has called our names to go out these next two weeks as his representatives in this city with his authority to do his work. (laughs) Christian, like every follower of Jesus, within the sound of my voice, you have been summoned by Jesus' love Not just to be saved by him, but to be sent out by him. And these next two weeks, again, just look at this like it's a short-term mission trip, just like it was for these first disciples. These next two weeks, God has placed you and me in metropolitan Washington, D.C., in a sea of over five million people who need Jesus. And he's sending you and me out in his name to do his work across this city, in your school, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, at that gym, that restaurant, wherever you go over the next two weeks, and none None of us, none of us needs to underestimate what can happen when we go out in the name of Jesus. Let me me tell you a story about Anil and Hari that I was looking back, I told, standing on this stage exactly five years ago this month, and I was reminded of it this week when I met a brother from India who lives in India who's living out the exact same story right now. And he had tears in his eyes telling me about all that God is doing in Jesus' name. So five years ago, I told you about Bihar, India. It's one of the most spiritually and physically impoverished places in the world. Bihar is a state in India about the size of Virginia. The only difference is Virginia has about 8 million people. Bihar has about 100 million people. Just feel the mass. Spread out across 45,000 different villages. The majority of these people are extremely poor, millions living in desperate poverty, and the majority of them are unreached by the gospel. They've never heard the good news of God's love in Jesus. Bihar is approximately 0.1% Christian. Most Indians in Bihar are Hindu and have been for generations, centuries. But I'll never forget a mission trip I was on in Bihar when I met Anil and Hari. So Anil is a school superintendent. Hari is a chicken farmer. And years ago, these brothers were struggling in their faith, struggling to share their faith when they came to some training that we had helped provide in disciple making. And at this training, they were encouraged to get in groups of two Go into a totally unreached village where there's no Christian, no church. Walk into the village, and the first person you speak to, use this line. Say, hi, we are here in the name of Jesus, and we would like to pray for your village. And ask how you can pray. And Anil and Hari looked at each other and said, this will never work. Then they listened some more, and they looked back at each other, and they said, but nothing else we do ever works, so we might as well try. So they got together one day, and they went out together into a village, no Christian, no church. They walk through the village, and nobody's even paying attention to them until finally, near the end of the village, somebody comes up to them, says, what are you guys doing here? I don't recognize you. So they start their prescripted line. Hi, we are here in the name of Jesus, and we would, before they could finish the rest of the line, the guy interrupted them and said, did you just say Jesus? Because I've heard a little bit about him. Can you guys tell me more? And Neil and Hari look at each other, say, yes, we can tell you more. And so they start to share about Jesus. But before long, the guy interrupts them again. And this is where Neil and Hari are thinking, ah, it's about to go south. But the guy says, wait a minute. I really want my friends and family to hear this. Can you come to my house and I can gather them together so they can also hear about Jesus? And Neil and Hari say, yes, we can do that. And so they follow this man to his house. He leaves them there. He goes, gets a group of his friends and family. They come back together. They gather around Anil and Hari and say, please tell us about Jesus. Anil and Hari, for the first time these people have ever heard, they speak the gospel to them, the good news of God's love in Jesus. And long story short, over the next two weeks, 
about 20 in that village come to faith in Jesus. So, yes, praise God for that part of the story, but here's where it gets better. Because as these new believers have come to faith in Jesus, and Neil and Hari looked at them and said, all right, here's what we're going to do. Get together in groups of two. And you're going to go out into other villages like yours, and you're going to go into a village, and the first person comes up to you, use this line, and you're not going to think it's going to work. But... It worked on you guys, so just, just go and see what happens. So they go out into village after village. So they start doing that. And within three years, church disciples have been made and churches had been planted in 350 different villages in Bihar, India. And this Indian brother I met this week is doing the same thing today. He was telling me, tears in his eyes about all that God is doing. So I'm thinking about our church family. Like right here, right now in this city, the opportunity we have to make disciples and multiply churches in the capital of our country. From here around the world, if 20 believers in Bihar, India, starting with two, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, proclaiming the gospel of God, could see what they have seen, how much more with thousands of people going out with the Spirit of God and the gospel of God in Jesus' name in this city? So let's do this. Like all of us. No matter how young or old you are in the faith, whether you're, whether you're a school superintendent or a chicken farmer, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter how far you have to go in this way or that way. Again, think about these disciples. It wasn't about them. It was about him. Amen. So let's go in Jesus' name. And then, second word of encouragement, let's trust in God's provision. i got to pick up the pace here. Uh, verse 8. Jesus charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. So get the picture here. No, I'm not telling you you need to find some sandals and a staff and a tunic, like your J's in your backpack or your suit in your briefcase, whatever, will be just fine. But get the picture here. Just imagine laying out on your bed everything that you would plan to take on a mission trip. And then hearing Jesus say, okay, put on one set of clothes and grab a toothbrush and let's go. The picture was clear. Jesus was calling his disciples to trust God to supply everything they would need on this trip. Amen. Jesus was calling them, inviting them into a journey of faith. And that is exactly what we're embarking on over the next two weeks. Yes. A journey of faith, of trust in God to give us, provide us everything we need to give us spiritual strength in our weakness, spiritual courage when we're tempted to cower, spiritual power that overcomes our timidity, you look over at the same charge Jesus gives, the parallel account of this story in Matthew chapter 10, and Jesus says, I and my Father, through the Holy Spirit, will give you everything you need, including the very words you need to speak in that moment. Just trust me. And this is so important. Don't miss this. Christian brother or sister, you don't need faith. You don't need trust in God to live out a quiet, casual, comfortable Christianity over the next two weeks. You can do that just fine on your own. You don't need the power of God to live out cultural Christianity where you're silent with the gospel. Millions of professing Christians are doing that on their own every week. But Jesus is calling us to something greater, yes. something higher. Yes. He's calling us to step out in faith, yes. 
to put our lives and our reputation on the line and to say, God, over these next two weeks, so again, just think the next two weeks. That's all we're talking about today. For two weeks to say, I don't want to sit back and settle for self-centered, self-saturated, casual, comfortable, cultural Christianity. This is not what I was made for. So I'm going to step out over the next two weeks. I'm going to trust you to give what I need. I, and God, I'm being honest with you. I'm weak. I'm timid. I'm afraid. I can't do this on my own. But on the, over the next two weeks, I want to step out in faith. Let the chips fall where they may. But I want to trust you to help me live this life you've created me to live. And it is the life you've been created to live. Your heart was not made to be glad in hoarding the gospel. It's not where joy and satisfaction in life are found. Your heart was made to be glad to experience life in giving the gospel away. Amen. It's what we're made for. And God is waiting for us to step out and trust him to do what only he can do. Don't you want to live that kind of life? Yes. That which can only be explained by his name and his power and his spirit at work. So let's step out and trust him to provide. Let's go in Jesus' name, trust in God's provision, and then third, so here it is. This is where the rubber meets the road. Let's call people to repent. Let's call people to repent. So this is the primary activity we're called to do on a mission trip. You don't travel somewhere on a mission trip saying, yeah, what are you going to go do? Well, I'm going to go to this place, and I'm going to smile like all week long and just be nice to people. Like, well, okay, that's good, but I mean, really? It seems like we're called to be more than just nice people. Yes, good people, of course. We're called to proclaim a message, which is why verse 12 says, so they went out and proclaimed, they spoke, that people should repent. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Because they were going out in Jesus' name with Jesus' authority and Jesus' message. And that's exactly what his message was. Remember Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15? We saw it in the very beginning. We've looked at it at different points. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying his first words in the book of Mark, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, the good news of God's love for you. Now, this is where we come to those of you who are not yet followers of Jesus, because this is God's message for you. It's the message of the entire Bible. It's the message God has brought you to this moment to hear how you and I and all of us have been created for relationship with God. We are created to walk with God, our creator, to know him and enjoy him forever. The problem is we have all sinned against God. We've turned aside from God and his ways to ourselves and our own ways. And our sin has separated us from God. And as a result of our sin against God, we deserve eternal judgment before God. But the good news of the Bible is that God loves us. God does not want any one of us to experience never-ending, everlasting judgment due our sin. God has come to us in the person of Jesus. And Jesus has paid the price for sin by dying on a cross. He's risen from the grave in victory over death so that anyone, anywhere who repents, turns from their sin and themselves and every attempt to save themselves and believes, trusts in the good news of God's love for us in Jesus will be forgiven of all your sin and restored to relationship with God for all of eternity. Amen. This is not my message. This is God's message. And we invite you on his behalf to believe it today. Repent and believe in the gospel. And then, so church, for every follower of Jesus, this is the message Jesus has given us 
to tell people all throughout the city over the next two weeks. Repent and believe in the gospel. Because people's lives for all of eternity are dependent on hearing and believing that message. Which leads us back to verse 11. So this picture of shaking the dust off your feet if people don't listen to you, this would basically be a symbolic gesture to indicate that somebody or a group of people, even a town, had rejected Jesus' call to repent. And the picture is, once the disciples, the followers of Jesus, have done their part and called people to repent, then they can't control how those people will respond. And if people reject the gospel, Jesus says, you've done your responsibility. How they respond is their responsibility. It's a similar picture to what we see in in Ezekiel chapter 33. The picture there in Ezekiel 33, God says, imagine you're a watchman on the wall and you see danger coming. As long as you blow the trumpet and sound the warning to those inside the walls, And the people can respond to that. If they don't respond to it and they're harmed or killed, the language is clear. You warn them, their blood is on their hands. But if you're that watchman and you see danger coming and you don't blow the trumpet, you don't sound the warning, and the people are harmed or killed, God says the blood of those people is on your hands. So get the picture, Christian brother or sister, because it's sobering. There are five million plus individuals in this city right now, many of whom we will interact with this week, for whom eternal danger is coming at any moment. And you and I know this. We know this. God has told us this. And sure, we can't control how people will respond to the gospel, but do you know what we can control? Whether people hear this gospel. Whether the people you go to school with or work with or meet this week, whether the people around us over the next two weeks hear the good news of God's love and the warning of God's judgment. We can control that. So the question is, will they hear that good news or warning from us? Yes. Or are we going to live over the next two weeks silent with everlasting danger headed their way? And we're saying nothing. God, help us not to be silent. God, help us to call people to repent. No matter how unpopular that may be, no matter what that means for your reputation, what is more important to you and me? Our comfort and our reputation or the souls of individual people? That leads to the fourth Word of encouragement for us on this mission trip, let's care for people in need. Let's care for people in need. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So much we could talk about here when it comes to casting out demons and evil spirits and healing the sick, but I don't want you to miss the big picture. Jesus was clearly calling his followers to go to people in need and care for them. Even the picture of anointing the sick with oil. There's only one other place we see this in the New Testament. In James chapter 5, and the oil was a symbol of the presence and the grace of God. It is a beautiful picture. Jesus is saying, go to people in need and care for them in such a way that they see my presence is with them and my grace is for them. Amen. Oh. What a perspective on our city over the next couple of weeks. Let's see below the surface. Let's put aside our narrow focus on all the stuff we've got to get done each day and the busyness of our lives. And let's intentionally ask, who is hurting around me? 
And how can I help them in such a way that they see in me that God is with them and God is for them? Amen. What a mission we've been given. What an honor to be on mission for Jesus. To be sent out in Jesus' name with his provision to share his message, show his love. What else better do you have to do with your life over the next two weeks? Amen. Like this is life. God is calling us to life, not to a miserable two weeks. I hardly know anybody who goes on a mission trip and lives doing this over the course of a couple of weeks in a particular place and walks away and is like, that was miserable. No, it's like, that's awesome. This is the way we're created to live. Do we see it? Like, step out of the mundane, casual, cultural Christianity. It's not what we're made for. We're made for mission. So, before we draw to a close, and actually before I give you the fifth word of encouragement, I want us to think together about our plan over the next two weeks here in this city. So you don't go on a mission trip without a plan for how you're going to spend your time. So I want to give you a few minutes before we close to at least think about, though I would encourage you to the extent possible to write this down. Just in the next couple of minutes, whether pen and paper or on a device, just somewhere, but don't get distracted when you pull out that device. But write down answers to three questions. So this is our gathering before we go out on the mission trip. Here are the questions I want to encourage you to think through, write out, answers to. Number one, who? Right, think intentionally right now about who in your sphere of influence can you call this week or next week to repent and believe in the gospel? Yeah. Like to go for it. Yes. Call this person to repent and believe in the gospel. So obviously we want to be open to conversations God will open up with people we don't know, like the Uber driver. But I'm guessing we all have people we already know who don't know Jesus. And if a lot of names don't come to our mind, we are probably hanging out with Christians too much. So write down who you will interact with, could interact with over the next two weeks who doesn't know Jesus. And then think, how am I going to care for them? And how am I going to call them to repent and believe in the gospel? So both and. Don't just think, how can I care for them? But the best way you can care for them is to lead them to eternal life. So how are you going to care and call them to repent and believe in the good news of God's love for them? So think through a plan. Maybe it's getting together with them for a meal or coffee or something else. Maybe it's an email or a letter that you can write and send. Maybe it's inviting them to church next week and going to lunch after that. So many different ways that this could play out. But how are you going to sound the warning and share the good news of God's love in Jesus over the next two weeks with at least one of the people under that who question, at least one. And then think about when, knowing there is an adversary who is just fine with you hearing this this morning and then doing nothing for days and retreating into casual, comfortable, cultural Christianity until you've forgotten all about this. That actually contributes to the hardening of your heart where you're just used to hearing the word and not doing it. Don't let him do that. So think and plan intentionally. When are you going to reach out in love to at least one of these people with the gospel? And if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're sitting here like, whoa, I'm feeling like you're like targeting people who are not followers of Jesus and this intentionality. And I would, I would just say this. Imagine for a moment. So I know maybe you're not yet a follower of Jesus, but imagine for a moment it's true that you're separated from God, your creator by sin, 
And if nothing changes, you're going to spend eternity in judgment. Wouldn't you want somebody being really intentional to share good news of how you can be restored to relationship with God for eternity? I wouldn't. You, if that were true, you would not want people sitting back silent in casual, comfortable, cultural Christianity. So I want to give you just a couple minutes before I give you the last word of encouragement, before we start this mission trip, to write down some of your thoughts. And I'm going to do the same up here uh, for the next couple minutes, just between each of us and God. Let's think together through who, how, and when. So just spend a couple moments right where you are before we scatter, before I even give you this last word of encouragement and answer these questions. And then I'll bring us back together. Spend a couple moments doing that right now before God. Who, how, and when. All right, you feel free to keep writing, thinking along these lines. Don't let me stop you by any means. But I do want to give this last word of encouragement before we start this mission trip. So let's go in Jesus' name, his authority, his spirit in us. Trust in his provision. Let's live, let's step out in faith. And do it. Call people to repent and believe in the gospel. As we care for people in need. And then, finally, let's share what God does. Let's share, encourage one another with what God does. So two Sundays from now, Lord willing, we'll get to Mark chapter 6, verse 30. When these disciples come back and encourage each other, 
as they share all that has happened on their trip. This is always one of the best parts of a mission trip because you get to see and hear about what Jesus has done in other people's lives, through their lives, in your own life, and through your life, you get to share, and through your life together, like I've been a part of this. Now that's obviously a bit challenging in light of a large group like this over multiple locations, though I would encourage you during church groups over the next couple weeks, share along these lines, share stories of what God does as we're on this mission trip together. And then at the same time, I want to provide us all an outlet to share with each other across the church. So I'm going to put an email address up here on the screen, missiontrip at mclanebible.org. And I want to ask every single follower of Jesus, in the sound of my voice, sometime over the next two weeks, to send an email to this address telling anything you've seen God do in you or through you. And feel free to send multiple ones, but let's start with just one. And let me be clear, it doesn't have to be an amazing story. I was sharing the gospel and this person, like tears were flowing down their eyes and they fell on their faces and started crying out to Jesus and then 10 others around them did the same thing. It was awesome. Like, so if that happens, like by all means, share that story. At the same time, also share the story of like, I stepped out, I did it, I spoke the gospel, at least I tried to, I kind of fumbled through the whole thing. And at the end, they were like, I don't want anything to do with that. And they walked away. Like share that one too. Because the likelihood is there's a variety of others who've experienced that same thing as well. Like it's always good. If you hear everybody's awesome stories and you're like, I only got a lame story, then you're kind of getting discouraged. The whole point is not even ultimately how people respond. What we've talked about, the whole point is that we're responding to Jesus and doing what he is calling us to do. And we can trust him with the fruit of that. So maybe you get the gospel put right back in your face this week, next week. But how many of us in our stories did that to somebody else? Some of us for years, but the seed had been planted in our hearts that bore fruit one day and praise God for the first person who shared with us anyway. So, so let's do this and then share your stories, whatever it is, share your story. I'm asking like teenagers, adults, kids, may not have an email address, have one of your parents like send in an email for you. Let's fill up this inbox with stories over the course of this two week mission trip and Lord willing, I'll share some of them in a way that encourages each other. And I should mention, I promise not to use your name unless I get permission from you first. So you don't have to be concerned. If you send something in, it's automatically going to be read with your picture up on the screen as this guy failed and this guy. No, that's the whole point. You didn't fail. You spoke. Uh, but even that, even with the awesome story, like it would miss the point. This is all about Jesus' message with Jesus' authority for Jesus' glory. So that's how I want to share our stories. Make sense? All right, welcome to the Metro DC 2022 Spring Break Mission Trip. <laughs> I love it. Some of you are clapping and some of you are like, ah, I guess I should. You signed up for this, you signed up for this. And you might say, well, we're a little, like some of your students are like, isn't that spring break? I wish it was spring break, but school's not out. But that's kind of the point. We're on mission in our schools and where we work. So we're, we're right here. God's put us here. Let's spend these two weeks on a mission trip and let's see what God does. Will you bow your heads with me? Uh, God, I am, I trust we are so thankful for a, a gospel to share. God, we're so thankful for the people even down to the individual person who shared the gospel with us so that we might know you and have eternal life with you. We praise you for the gospel. We praise you for saving us from our sin and filling us with your spirit. God, just speak Acts 1-8 over all of your people in this gathering right now. You have 
filled us with your Holy Spirit's power that we might be witnesses. You have invited us to step out in faith on mission with you. So we say together, yes, yes. We want to step out in faith. Help us, help us. We need your help. We confess we're not the sharpest tools in the shed. And, and that's the point we trust, that when we're weak, you're strong. And when we're timid, you're powerful. And when we don't know what to say, you give us the words to say. So may it be so. We're trusting you to provide as we go out over the next couple of weeks. And we pray. God, we ask, do that which can only be explained by your hand in our own lives and through our lives. God, we, we ask for people in this list of who's that we've thought about, you've put on our minds and our hearts. We pray that some of them, many of them would come to know eternal life in Jesus this week. We know that is a supernatural miracle that only you can bring about. So we pray as we go out as your representatives that it would happen. You would bring the miracle of new life. And then even, even when we don't see that happen in front of our eyes, that we would experience the joy of obedience to you. Make us not the church that we have in our minds, that we're so tempted to create in our day. Make us the church that you desire for us to be, followers of Jesus on mission for your glory. May it be so. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. amen.